but welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Payne. I'm the director of the Bronx County Historical Society. I recognize some of your names who are in attendance and, uh, and there's more that I don't recognize, but uh, glad to see everyone here. And thank you for choosing to spend uh, a Monday night here in January with us. Uh, and we've got an interesting presentation uh, prepared for tonight. Um, I'll turn it over in a second to my colleague, Roger McCormick, who's the Director of Education at the Bronx County Historical Society, and he'll introduce our guest speaker. Um, but uh, really happy to see all of you here. And just to put a couple things on folks' radars, we have more events coming up in February and in March, some virtual, some in-person, some hybrid. Um, so if you are interested in learning more about our events, um, you can go to www.bronxhistoricalsociety.org or you can just type bronxhistoricalsociety.org and that'll get you there even quicker. Um, I'll share that link in a second. Uh, and I will also be sharing a link to the press where you can buy the book, which is the topic of tonight's talk, um, which Roger will uh, give you the title in a second. And we also have a discount code um, for that book. Uh, um, it's a really, really wonderful and interesting guidebook on the Bronx. Roger will talk more about it in a second. Um, I'll put that in the chat and I'll also put the Bronx Historical Society website in the chat. And finally, uh, a, final, um, a final note, uh, if you enjoy tonight's presentation and if you want to support the work of the Bronx Historical Society, we always appreciate your support. There's a donate button on our website. Um, and you can also, if you want to do the old fashioned way um, of sending in a check uh, on our website, there's the address and you can, you, you can donate that way as well. But thank you everyone for being here. We're very delighted to offer this program. We have more book talks coming up in the future. Um, so please check that out. And, uh, and now I'll turn it over to Roger, our Director of Education. Oh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so it's my uh, pleasure to introduce um, Blaine Helmrick, who is the widow of William Helmrick, who wrote the book that we're gonna be talking about tonight. And I have it, I have it here or I'll hold it the other way, maybe. The Bronx, Nobody Knows, an Urban Walking Guide, which goes neighborhood by neighborhood. Very interesting socio sociological work, very interesting ethnography, very interesting on the history of the Bronx and on demographic change. But Ms. Helmerk is a native of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, she now lives on Long Island. She was educated at CUNY. Uh, she was employed as a uh, speech pathologist for over 40 years. In addition to writing a historical novel, The Chimney Tree, published by the Toby Press in 2003. She's also worked as a ghostwriter and as a proud mother and grandmother. In the last 15 years, she has spent much time accompanying her late husband, William, on his walks through New York City for the Nobody Knows series. Uh, there's also guidebooks on Brooklyn and Queens and a larger book called The New York Nobody Knows on the entire city. She has walked nearly all of the Bronx with him, learning to appreciate the beauty and complexity of our fascinating uh, borough. Uh, so, Elaine, um, talk about the, the process and the research that went into uh, the Bronx Nobody Knows. You know, how much time would, would your husband spend and you, would you spend in the neighborhood before he wrote about it? And how much time, you know, and what, what did he do when he, when he walked and when he was doing research? Well, we didn't do, he didn't do the research before he went into a neighborhood. He wanted to go into a neighborhood blind, as I would say, without having any preconceived notions, without having read about what other people said about this particular neighborhood. He wanted to see the neighborhood as a blank slate and that whatever he would find, that was what would be of importance to him. And then later, after he had walked the neighborhood and had recorded all of his observations, he would then do research on the neighborhood to augment everything that he had learned on his own so that he could write about it you know from a from a perspective not only of what he had seen but of knowledge in general uh when we walked the neighborhoods he was he was looking for all of the unusual and different kinds of things that people don't necessarily know about the bronx uh, he didn't write about the bronx zoo 
he wrote about things that, you know, he didn't write about Yankee Stadium. He wrote about things that people really would be surprised to learn. People, Some people in the borough would know, but many, many people who were not from the Bronx and even those who were would not have known about them. And, it, you know, how, how much time he spent in a particular neighborhood really depended on how large that neighborhood was, how many people we met, on, you know, we would encounter during our walks that we could speak to, how much they spoke to us, how much, how, how many interesting things we found in a particular neighborhood. So it was really a question of, like a treasure hunt, like we would just go into the neighborhood and see what we could find, see who we could speak to, and then he would do the research afterwards. Very, very interesting. Um, talk about your background and your husband's background. What what drew him to writing this? Um, he, 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 he relays an interesting anecdote in his introduction where he says that when he was young, his father would take him to the last stop yes. on subway lines, and then, then they would just you know walk around for a while. He he cites that as the kind of the, yeah. the the reason for his his later interest. But talk more about talk more about that. That's very true. I mean, he grew up in New York City. He grew up in Manhattan, and uh, first on the Upper West Side, and later in Washington Heights. And from the time he was a boy of about nine until about age fourteen, on Sundays, his father gave him the gift of time. He would take him on whatever subway line they decided to take to the last stop. That was the game they played. They called it last stop. And they would ride whatever subway to the last stop. And then they would get out and walk around the neighborhood. And they did this with all the various subway lines that they could access. And when they had done all the last stops, they would do the next to the last stop on the different subway lines. And then the third to the last stop so that they had, walked around many, many, many neighborhoods together for for several hours on Sundays. And my husband learned to love and appreciate the city. And he was a lifelong New Yorker who really loved New York City. And he felt that, he always said that New York City was the world's greatest outdoor museum. Uh, and it, this this led him to really appreciate the city and in, in, in really in depth. And and then, you know, he became a, a sociologist so that when he would walk the city, he would see it from a sociological perspective as well. And for many years, he was teaching a course on peoples of the city of New York, where he would teach his students about all the various neighborhoods and ethnic groups and you know, everything from a sociological perspective. He also, he would take his students on rides on Sundays to a lot of the different neighborhoods in the in the borough that he happened to be working on and show them a lot of the, the interesting sites that he had come up with. Um, so you said he, he his day job, he, he taught sociology at City right. College, I believe. So City College and at the Graduate Center of CUNY. Graduate Center of CUNY. Uh, talk more about how that impacted the work and how did he, like, how did he, how did he incorporate sociology into his guidebooks? And how did that impact his research on the Bronx? Well, the original book was the New York Nobody Knows, and that book wasn't so much a guidebook as a, a sociological book about New York City. He focused on things that people didn't know, and he and he also incorporated different anecdotes and things. But he wrote the book from a sociological perspective, so that each chapter dealt with a different concept, such as uh, the ethnic future of the city, gentrification, space, community, entertainment, things like that. All all these different sociological concepts, and each chapter related to them. As you know, and had in terms of how they related to the city itself, whereas the the later books on the individual boroughs were much more 
guidebooks. They told you, you know, how to walk, where to go, what to see. And they did incorporate sociology as it was relevant, but not in the kind of depth that the original New York Nobody Knows book uh, had. I think it was it was the publisher Princeton's idea that after he had done the New York Nobody Knows book, they wanted these individual guidebooks for each borough separately. Very interesting. Talk about your role in the uh, the Bronx. Nobody knows. Um, you worked as a you worked as a writer, as a ghost writer, as an editor. Did you edit his work? Did you um, help to write certain certain chapters? Uh, what was your role? Bill was a fabulous writer. He didn't really need me to write anything. <laughs> he was he he wrote in a beautiful and accessible style. And I just edited in terms of, you know, reading everything he wrote. And if I thought something could be phrased slightly differently for whatever reason, or, you know, I would add or subtract something. But generally, he wrote whatever he wrote, he wrote one draft, and that was pretty much done. And he didn't really need a lot of editing. But I did my role in terms of the Bronx, nobody knows, I did walk with him through almost all of the streets of the Bronx. And to, in order to prepare myself to do that, I also, I, I did research on the different uh, things that we saw. I would look them up and find out what was, you know, what was said about them. And in addition, when I, when I would walk with him, I, I learned the various architectural styles of the buildings of the Bronx. I had to study, learn what all these architectural elements that were on the buildings were, learned about Art Deco, learned about all the different architectural terms like turels or coins or, uh, you know, turrets or, um, you know, what's a Victorian house. And, and, all these different architectural terms I had to become more familiar with so in order to help describe these uh, various buildings. Um, so really, I mean, this is, the fascinating thing about the book is that he's, he's pulling in and interweaving all these different things. Like he's talking about art deco buildings on the Grand Concourse, for example. He's talking about dem demographics. He's doing ethnography. Um, but really what comes is very vivid to me is his his is this incredibly incredible skill at interviewing just people he stumbled across while he was walking um was this this came out of his background in sociology or where did he get this where did this kind of talent of his arise from and when did he when did he begin to start doing it this was something that he had his entire life um, he was, he had a very outgoing, very gregarious personality. He was very naturally friendly. He was very personally charming. He knew how to speak to people in a non-threatening manner and how to, uh, how to just get their trust. And he, I mean, he wrote a book, his first book was about a, a, a black militant organization in St. Louis when he is a, a, a white individual, was able to interview all these people, gain their trust, and write a book about them, which at the time was published by Harper and Rowe. He was just a, a graduate student when he was doing that book. And all, all his life, he was just very congenial, very friendly. And part of it, I think his, his sociological training also helped him to, to know how to approach people, you know, how not to threaten them, how to disarm them, and how to get information from them without being intrusive. It was always amazing to me because I don't have those skills. I'm a much more, you know, reserved and reticent person. And it was always amazing to me to see how he could speak to any individual that he came across, whether it was a an unhoused person sitting on a park bench that people would have been afraid to approach or a nuclear physicist in a, in, a, in a university. He knew how to speak to everyone and he would always very quickly find out everything about them. If it was in a neighborhood that it, he would ask them what neighborhood they came from, where they lived, and he would tell them something specific about their block or about their neighborhood. 
and somehow always was able to get people to talk about whatever he wanted to discuss with them. And he always left them laughing. He would speak to them and then he would leave them with a joke, some kind of banmo, and they would laugh. And it was always amazing to me how he could do that. Didn't matter who it was, he could he would always leave them laughing. And I think that wasn't so much a function of his being a sociologist or an ethnographer as it was of his special personality, the unique traits that he had. And, you know, he had, you, you use the word disarm, you know, that people would open up to him. And I find like a, a lot of really interesting conversations and, you know, not just you think like maybe small talk, but really kind of interesting conversations that shed light on a lot of issues that the borough is, you know, facing, gentrification being one. So talk mm -hmm. about, you know, talk about what, in his interviews, what he learned about the Bronx and what, what, what did it show was, was going on for, about particular issues and how people felt about them? Like, for example, gentrification. Well, gentrification is a very controversial issue, as we know. And we did talk to people in the Bronx. I mean, this book, we started walking in 2018, and a lot of things have happened since then. But at the time that he wrote the book, people were talking about Mott Haven, that they thought that that would become an area of gentrification. And at the time, nothing much was happening. But there was all this talk about this um, the Somerset Company that had bought a large tract of land in Mott Haven along the waterfront and was later sold to a, I, another company. I don't remember that. Brookfield, perhaps. I can't remember the name of it, but a different company brought it, bought the, bought the, the and now I understand they're building a luxury apartment complex in that area, but there's going to be, I think, 30% of the of the apartments will be for um, affordable housing. And so certain areas of, of the Bronx are definitely gentrifying and people we spoke to were both pro and con. A lot of people were against gentrification. There's in, in Morris Heights, there's a, a mural on the wall, an anti-gentrification mural that's very interesting. Uh, it shows a, a, a big, exterminator, a Dr. Dror, Dor, Dr. Dor, who looks like a bo bohemian type. And he's out to, 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 to gentrify this neighborhood and the, and the local residents are depicted as bees. And he's trying to spray the hive and get rid of the bees. And, and the, the bees are saying things like, oh no, not another Whole Foods. <laughs> uh, and uh, and and you, and you could see at the end there's a tremendous battle between uh, the exterminator and and the bees who are trying to fight back, and it it depicts really what people's attitudes are. I mean, if you're a, a, a low income person who's renting an apartment in a neighborhood, and the neighborhood starts to gentrify, first of all, your rent can go up a certain amount. The landlord can raise your rent a certain amount because he may want you to leave so he can rehab the apartment. There, because of a law that was passed a few years back, they can't jack up the rents as high as they used to. I think they can't go that high. They used to jack it up at least 10%. They can't do that anymore. But even so, I mean, if, if your neighborhood is gentrifying and you're a renter, people are moving in that you have nothing in common with. The stores that you're accustomed to, you know, the, the stores where low-priced items are sold will be replaced by other stores that are much more expensive, trendy boutiques. The, the coffee, the bodega on the corner where you bought your cup of coffee for a low price is going to be replaced by a, a coffee, a fancy coffee shop where you'll have to pay $4 for a cup of coffee. I can understand that you would not be happy with this. You know, there are certain benefits when neighborhoods gentrify. There are trickle-down benefits, you know, to, there may be certain new jobs that are available and crime will go down generally. But the people who live in those neighborhoods and, are, you know, are renting, they're, they're kind of used to living in a, in a crime, a high crime area. They learn how to deal with it. They learn how to live with it. 
they'd rather live the way they've been in their neighborhood than have to live cheek by jowl with people that they have nothing in common with who probably want nothing to do with them. And ultimately, many of them are kind of forced to move to other areas. Right. Um, that's very interesting. And you had mentioned, like, obviously, ch changing rapidly as we speak the Bronx, but you said he started doing the research in 2018. How, how long did it take before, I guess, maybe two years before it was published? And wh what did he see well, change? No, in that time? It, took, it took longer. I mean, because oh, of man. we, he finished the book, but, and, but then I think COVID put, you know, the, there was COVID. The, the book on Queens came out shortly after he passed away. And then the book on the, and then the Bronx book was in production and it came out uh, in, in August of, uh, I guess it was 2022. I'm not even sure I have to check when it was exactly published because we were already walking in Staten Island. So it came out in 2023. So that's when it was actually published. And we had already been walking Staten Island for the last number of months before COVID hit. Um, if you if you were to say like the f three or four, four or five most important things people learn about the Bronx from this book, what would they be? Well, he found that, A, we found that there were, uh, there was a great deal of hope People who live in the Bronx seem to feel that the Bronx was getting better, things were going to improve, at least at this particular point in time when we were there. They had a lot of hope for the for the neighborhood. They felt that it was going to get better and things were going to improve for them. Another one was the history of the Bronx. The Bronx has a tremendous amount of history, and there are a lot of very old buildings that it, more than in, in some other boroughs. There are a lot of very old buildings that give you a sense of what old New York was like in a number of the neighborhoods. There's also a strong sense of community in the Bronx where people are proud of their neighborhood. There's a certain esprit de corps of living in the Bronx. They say, we people in the Bronx, we tell it like it is, you know, we're down to earth. We don't, you know, we don't care about any of this fancy stuff. We're, this is the Bronx, you know? And, um, so there's a certain feeling of community and, and community pride. And uh, in addition, there's, there's what I'm trying to think of the last, it's, it's just, there's also a tremendous amount of beauty in the Bronx. The Bronx has beautiful parks as Pelham Bay Park, which is the biggest park in, in New York City larger than Central Park and really, really beautiful. There are many parks. Van Cortland Park is a beautiful park. Bronx Park. There's a lot of really beautiful wild areas. And in addition, all the old beautiful buildings, like the Art Deco buildings, like the Park Plaza or some of the buildings on the Grand Concourse. And very, very beautiful. And the community gardens, there are many, many community gardens in the Bronx where people enjoy planting and harvesting, and, and that also adds beauty to the neighborhood. And there's also a sense of friendliness. Like, we didn't know what to expect. The people in the Bronx turned out to be very, very friendly, very happy to talk to us. Nobody refused to speak to, to us when we asked questions, and just people were very friendly. They, and helpful. There was Seton Hall Park. Um, Bill came there on a day when I was not with him that day. And he, he, there was a woman walking by and he asked her if she'd ever been in that park. And she said, no, even though she'd lived in the area for 20 years, she had never gone into the park because she said it, she didn't know if it was safe. But she said, you know what, if you'll walk with me, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to walk with you in the park. And so they walked for a while in Seton Hall Park, this woman who had never been there, but she knew that he was writing a book about the Bronx and she wanted to help him and make sure that he'd be safe. 
and maybe she also felt a little bit safer walking with him in the park rather than alone. So, that's very. That's a very nice story. Yeah. And you par partially answered this, but your husband mentioned, you know, of course, Tom Wolf, the bonfire of the vanities, paints this you know, very derogatory portrait of the Bronx in the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, when he, when you, when he went into the book, did he have preconceptions about the Bronx, and you know, how do they change as he did the did the research and, and wrote the book? Well. He well, he, of course, he first walked the Bronx when he um, wrote the original book, The New York Nobody Knows, uh, I, and then walked it again for the second for the Bronx Nobody Knows. I I think everyone had some kind of preconceived notions about the Bronx because the Bronx had such a bad press, especially the South Bronx. You know, movies like Fort Apache. You know, it 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 it. it in general, it had a reputation, and some of it was well deserved. But going into the Bronx and walking the streets at all all times of the day, at all seasons, all kinds of weather, and finding that nobody really was hostile, people were friendly. You could walk almost any street without encountering any kind of danger. Uh, as long as you follow the rules which he set down in the appendix of the book. Now, there are ways of walking in these neighborhoods. You can't walk, you know, a, a, a group of people is not as safe as one or two people alone. Two people are safer than one alone, but three people is already, that's a crowd. You attract attention. You, and you, you know, you don't dress in colors that are going to attract attention like gang colors like red or blue or bright green. You wear neutral, plain clothing. You don't walk around, of course, with jewelry or a purse or anything like that. You walk around and try to look nondescript. And you can make eye contact with people. But if you do, you have to smile and say, you know, how are you doing or something like that. You don't try to look tough. You don't put on a game face. You let people walk on the sidewalk. You don't try to block them. You know, this is their turf. It's not your turf. There are all different ways that he lists of how to walk through these neighborhoods without causing anybody to uh, become hostile or threatened by you. And um, I think we he found and I found that the Bronx was a much more pleasant and friendly place than people expect it to be. What what year was uh, the new, the New York Nobody Knows published? I think it came out in two thousand thirteen. Oh, I see. Okay, and I was I was going to ask you know if he if you were to write like a updated edition of it today, what what do you think would change in the like if he wrote a guidebook today about the Bronx and with COVID and with well more kind of luxury apartments and gentrification what, yeah. what would he what, what would he what would he add or change today? Well, all of all of those things i mean the city new york city is constantly changing and a lot of things have happened since the book was written especially covid you know which affected crime rates in different ways and just so many stores and places that we may have written about i don't know if they're still there because so many places went out of business and changed hands as a result of COVID or just in general. But there certainly there is more uh, evidence of gentrification in the Bronx. And while certain crimes have actually gone up after a dip, they went up again, namely auto theft and, um, and uh, I think felony, felony crime, you know, felony, felonious assaults went up. But the murder rate has definitely dropped since since uh, the last number of years have gone by. That kind of crime has gone up. Violent crime, I think, has, that kind of violent crime has gone down. But you know, there the city is always in flux. It's hard to know what's going to happen. I would say that that there are part, that definitely parts of the Bronx are gentrifying since we were there. Okay. Would you like to say anything else before we turn it over to our audience? And Stephen, would you like to ask any questions? 
Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but Helene, if you, if you want to go ahead and, and if there's anything else you'd like to add, but I have, I have a couple, um, uh, kind of fun questions for you. Well, there were a lot of really interesting places in the Bronx that I never knew existed. And, um, I can list some of them and talk about them if you'd like. Oh, and he also, I, I forgot to mention his wonderful maps, which are incredibly useful because, you know, it's, there's a lot of debate, you know, what is the boundary of Fordham, yeah. say, you know, and he is really interesting. He's, he, he acknowledges the debates, but he's still, you know, commonly agree boundaries and have really excellent maps. So I, any, right. anyone who's interested in that should get the book for that reason I, alone. I think he, he based the maps um, from the community board, the community boards of the Bronx, because there is a lot of question about the boundaries of different neighborhoods and it depends on who you ask. Even the people who live in those neighborhoods had different opinions about where the boundaries were. So he generally stayed with the community board boundaries and sometimes the Encyclopedia of New York by Kenneth Jackson. Um, but there were so many interesting places to see and and there were surprises. Like that's another thing that we that he found that we found that the Bronx had a lot of surprises, things that we didn't expect, like the waterfall in River Park. There's a waterfall. It's the largest waterfall in the city that that's on a natural body of water. It's not a natural waterfall. It's not like like falls that you know come cascading over the rocks naturally. It's the result of a dam that was built. And when they, they built this dam across the Bronx River, what was interesting was that they built a certain kind of a ladder on the side of the dam so that the fish could swim upstream and find new habitats and new sources of food. They built a certain kind of ladder that, was, that enabled the fish in the Bronx River to go upstream. And the, the the waterfall itself is very beautiful. It's in River Park. It's near the Bronx Zoo. And it's, it's a very interesting site. You don't expect to see something like that in the middle of the Bronx. There's also a, a, a synagogue that's hidden within a, a, a nursing facility. There was a place that used to be called Daughters of Jacob, and it was a nursing home. And now it has a different name. Um, but it had a synagogue within it that's, it looks like a Greek temple. It's on top of a hill and it's like a building with spokes radiating, radiating out of it that are different wings of the nursing home. But if you go inside, if you're able to get inside and you see this synagogue, it's perfectly, perfectly preserved and really beautiful. But there are no, almost no religious symbols inside because now it's a non-denominational church. But it's an incredible sight to see. It's not easy to get in to see it, but it's, it, it was really well worth seeing it. And there's also Poe Cottage. Edgar Allan Poe in 1846 moved into a cottage. And at that time, the Bronx was country. It was bucolic. It was, you know, forests and trees and, and meadows. And he he moved into this cottage there with his wife, Virginia, because she had tuberculosis and they thought that the country air would be good for her. Unfortunately, she it didn't really cure her and she passed away about a year or two later. But he lived in that cottage for a while until until the time that he passed away in Baltimore. And he was apparently very happy there and very productive. He wrote um, the poem Ula Loom and he wrote Annabelle Lee. And, and bells while he was living in that cottage. And it's near the Grand Concourse. So it's very interesting. There are just so many interesting places that we came across. So w one question I have for you, which um, depends on, on, I guess, the, the time of day that you probably visited, uh, you know, certain neighborhoods, but are there any eating establishments, you know, whether they just be, you know, little um, kind of lunch counter places or, you know, larger kind of restaurants that stood out to you when you all were walking the neighborhoods, ones that, you know, stick in your memory still? I really don't remember the names of any of it. I remember 
I remember there was a place, there was a place, we didn't eat there, but there was a place called Emilio's Pizza that had an amazing mural painted on it, on the walls. Uh, it's on the corner, so the, the mural is painted on two different walls. And it's like bright red and gray and black and white and green and yellow with chartreuse, all different kind of geometric shapes with bright red tomatoes and dispersed. And it, it's on the, the walls of this Emilio's Pizzeria. And then, of course, you have Arthur Avenue. You have all these amazing Italian restaurants on Arthur Avenue. And many of them are, are quite famous. And that it's, it's, Arthur Avenue in general is very interesting because it also has the retail market, which is like a covered bazaar. It's like being in the, the marketplace in, in Algeria or something. And it's got, it sells everything, you know, produce, fish, meat, cheeses, dry goods. It has a cigar emporium where you can watch the people rolling the cigars. It's just a fascinating place. Uh, in general, there are so many interesting things to see. Which um, neighborhoods or maybe sections of neighborhoods uh, if if you remember, were you most kind of drawn to or impressed by as you were walking the Bronx? It's really hard to say because so many neighborhoods had so many points of interest. I mean, if you want to see beautiful houses, you could walk in, in Riverdale or, you know, especially in Fieldston where there are beautiful mansions. Um, there's part of Riverdale Spite and Dival has the Charlotte Bronte residence, which are these beautiful, it, it looks like something that would be on the on the Italian coast, on the Amalfi coast, a beautiful set of buildings of attached, I guess, apartments. I don't know if they're condominiums or how it works now, but it's it looks like something from many, many years ago that you would find on, on the coast of, of Italy. Really, really beautiful and interesting. And then, there were so many other neighborhoods. I mean, like I said, like Belmont, where, you know, with Arthur Avenue. Um, I mean, it's just hard to, to really narrow it down. Sure. Ro Roger, would you like to add any other questions before we, we start with Q&A? I think we're good to begin. Can you can you see all the questions on your end, Roger? I think you can. Yeah, so I have, I have a question. Um, John Daly, did you ever feel unsafe in any of the neighborhoods you visited? And then he adds, he enjoyed the book immensely. Uh, there was one particular area. I don't remember what neighborhood it was, unfortunately. At the, there was a park that was next to a, a homeless shelter. And there were, it looked kind of forbidding, but we walked through it anyway. And, and it was fine. It was okay. Um, there was there was a housing project where people warned us not to walk through it, but we did anyway, and that was Edenwald. Apparently, it was a high crime area, but nobody just nobody bothered us. We were fine, and you know, sometimes I would feel a little bit unsafe, you know, if I would see people on this, you know, clusters of people on the street that young teenage boys, you know, clustered on the street, I sometimes would be a little on my guard. But as I said, Bill knew how to navigate the streets and how to deal with these situations. And, and we were fine. Nobody bothered us. Thank you. Um, Margaret McGrath asks, how did Local Law 11 affect the architecture of the buildings in each borough, especially the Bronx? And then she asks, how do you feel about these excessively tall buildings uh, in sunlight? I don't know what local law 11 is, so you'll have to explain it. It, it requires a certain level of exterior upkeep to, uh, <laughs> to buildings. I think it was passed maybe in the early 2000s, but um, I could be wrong there. Uh, and what is the question again? How does it affect? What can you repeat the question? Uh, so, how does it affect the architecture of buildings in each borough, especially the Bronx? And then she adds, "How do you feel about 
excessively tall buildings and sunlight. Okay, the first question, I don't know if you're referring to the actual upkeep or the scaffolding that has to go around the buildings in order to enable the upkeep, which which interferes with being able to see the beauty of the buildings. But it is important to restore or to to continue to keep up the architectural features of the buildings. There's an issue with um, with uh, Parkchester, where Parkchester has beautiful sculptures on the corners of many, many of its buildings and above the doors. And I read an article not long ago that a lot of these sculptures are now missing. They've been taken down and they have not been replaced. I don't know if they're being repaired, repainted. I don't know what's happening, but I read that a lot of these beautiful sculptures have been taken down. I don't know if it's because of this law, because they, they were posing a danger. Maybe they were in danger of falling off. I really don't know. As far as um, as far as tall buildings, it's, you know, a lot of times, very, very tall buildings are resented by the the people who live around them. I, I remember there was a, there's a very tall building where people say, what's the best view in this neighborhood? The best view is from the top of this very tall building, because from that build, if you if you look at it from that view, you can't see that very tall building if you're in the building itself and you look out. So that's the best view. Uh, Tall buildings can can benefit a neighborhood, you know, when the, when housing is needed. But on the other hand, they block vistas. They they prevent people from enjoying the view, and they in many ways, um, I don't want to say destroy the character of a neighborhood, but they can change the character of a neighborhood if a neighborhood has a small charming quaint buildings and suddenly there are these massive <coughs> glass towers they don't really look as though they fit it's a, you know it's a question it's like gentrification is this good or is this bad it has both robert farkas wants to know will we see any illustrations from the book i think the answer is probably no and but buy it because it's a discount tonight so <laughs> There yes. aren't illustrations, but there are photographs. There are photographs, photographs of, right. Photographs. There are many photographs in the book of the places that, that are written about. Uh, Tony Mondesiere wants to know, is there, is there any, surpri any surprises, like the handful of indigenous settlements and villages that existed before um, the Dutch and the Anglo-colonial settlers came to the Bronx? I know, for example, this isn't his question, but I know, for example, like, uh, the Grand Concourse, that's a, a parallel to an old Native American trail. So there's like, do you have, do you have any uh, comments on that? I really don't know too much about, in you know, indigenous neighborhoods that were, you know, there is a, an area called Indian Village in the Bronx, but, I, you know, it was a rather upscale neighborhood, actually. But I, I'm not sure if I, I don't even, if I understand the question, did we come across any villages from when? I think predating Dutch settlement and wrong. I'm not sure I understand it either. I, I guess it could be like any lore, you know, because sometimes, sometimes local residents might say, oh, you know, like, according to people who've lived here a long time, this used to be X, Y, Z, that kind of thing. Um, I guess maybe in particular going back to pre-colonial times, if there's any lore you heard about, you know, indigenous history in the Bronx, that might be a good way to take it. I don't know of anything like that, but I do know about an indigenous, a group of indigenous people who were brought to the Bronx, which is an interesting story in itself, if I can tell you. Um, it was in Highbridge and in, in, in the 1800s, I believe. Um, Admiral Peary had gone to the uh, to the Arctic, and he was asked by Franz Boas, who was an anthropologist, to bring back a group of indigenous peoples, namely Inuit, to bring them back to New York. 
And so he did. He brought back a family of Inuit people and he installed them in the in the Museum of Natural History, where people would come and look at them and view them as if they were animals in the zoo. And when while, when they weren't on display, they were living in an apartment in Highbridge in the Bronx. And unfortunately, because they came from a place where they weren't exposed to other people, they didn't have resistance to all the illnesses that people in New York and the, had at the time. And so most of them succumbed to illness within a short time. But one of them, who was a young boy, was adopted by the director of the museum. And and he raised him. Uh, and he, <clears throat> I think they lived in the Bronx. And he raised this child, whose name was Minnick. And then Minnick at some point wanted to go back to his native country and he wanted to take his father's bones with him. And the museum refused to release the bones. And Minnick, the Inuk, was very angry and he called the people a race of scientific criminals. He said, I'm lucky you didn't put my brains in a jar. I'm lucky to get out of here. And he left and went back, I think, to Greenland, where he came from, from Greenland. And um, I think those bones were not released from the museum until like 1993 or something like that. So that was a story about an indigenous group of people who were not from the Bronx, but were from Greenland and brought to the Bronx. That's a really interesting story. Much like the Smithsonian, their various things they've done, Native mm -hmm. peoples. Uh, Gregory Jost wants to know, for those of us who know a lot about the Bronx, what can we expect to learn? What new things do we can we expect to learn from this book? Well, as I said before, there are many, it depends on what you knew about the Bronx already, but you can learn about those five things that I mentioned earlier, that the, there's a lot of hope. People are hopeful in the Bronx. People, there's friendliness. People are, are much more friendly than you would, you know, if, if you have a negative uh, impression of the Bronx, you will find that it's not, it, it, that, that impression may be wrong. You will find that there's new, a lot of new construction going on in the Bronx. There were a lot of buildings, the South Bronx, which was considered absolutely like the worst place, is now full of many new buildings because a lot of the old buildings were burned in the 80s. And now there's a lot of new construction, new buildings, a lot of affordable housing. There's just many, there's a lot of change. There's also like new, new, new luxury apartments going up along the waterfront, as I said, in Mott Haven. And there are all kinds of surprises. If you walk around the neighborhood, you see unusual and different things that you did not expect to see. So the Bronx is, is a really fascinating and complex borough. T.J. Torres would like to know if you're able to view the apartments or lobbies on the Grand Concourse when you're walking. And I think the answer is yes. I think yes, we did. We did, and they're very beautiful. I mean, there there are these terrazzo floors and all kinds of mosaics on the walls, and many of them. There's one apartment that has mosaics that look like all different kinds of fish on the outside of it, and it's very beautiful, very colorful. Many of these old buildings are now somewhat being preserved and, and rehabbed, and they're very beautiful to see these these lobbies. There's a you can see what what it was like when it was in its glory days. Uh, William Kinsella would like to know, uh, perhaps different from the official neighborhood boundaries defined by the community board, did, did you and William have a sense of natural boundaries when traversing the neighborhoods? Do you sometimes have a clear sense that you were leaving one neighborhood and entering another? If so, how did that work? Generally, it was not so much like that unless one neighborhood was very much different from others. Like Riverdale is is not like the rest of the Bronx. It has a much more suburban feel. And of course, City Island is surrounded by water. It's an island, so it has a, a different feel to it. And it's also, it's more of a, it feels like a fishing village resort town combination. 
compared to the rest of the Bronx. Although there are other neighborhoods like that too, like Edgewood Park, which is also like a fishing village and is very different from the other neighborhoods around it. So there are certain neighborhoods that definitely have a different feel, but there are others where you would not know where one ends and the other begins and you have to rely on the map. Uh, Judith Caro would like to know is that did you find, uh, you and Bill, did you find the daughters of the American Revolution gra gravestones on Zurega and Westchester Avenue? Did I see them? Yes, or five. I, I don't think so. No, I don't recall seeing that. I remember there was a cemetery that we came across. I think it was St. Raymond's, but I don't remember seeing those kinds of, of headstones there. Leslie Cutler would like to know, and this is, I think, talked about in the book. Did people talk to you about how the Cross Bronx Expressway uh, destroyed the Bronx? There, yeah, uh, there were some people who mentioned that, and that there's a book about that actually called All That Is Solid Melts Into Air by Marshall Berman. And it talks about, and also, of course, the, the book about Robert Moses by Robert Caro. Um, the, People really, there were people who really felt that the Cross Bronx destroyed the neighborhoods, and it did. It, it, it cut right through, and and you know destroyed existing neighborhoods, and people were forced to move. On the other hand, there are people who defend it and say, well, you know, it gave people a way to get from one place to another very quickly and deliver goods and services that they weren't before they had to go through the local streets. And when neighborhoods are destroyed, new neighborhoods spring up in their place. So, you know, that's also a benefit. And it, it's really, uh, you know, Rob, Robert Moses has his detractors, but he also has his defenders. You know, Jane Jacobs was very much opposed to Robert Moses and the things he did. But on the other hand, he, he defended himself. He said, look, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. You can't move you can't move a neighborhood without displacing people. You know, you can't change a neighborhood without displacing residents. There's no way. So but uh, definitely it's a very controversial topic. I also think they were asking if you like, interviewed anyone that had lived also in that, or maybe I'm misreading it, but did you did you interview or did Bill interview anyone that had been displaced along the route of the Cross Bronx Expressway and that had to live, had to move somewhere else in the Bronx? I don't think we interviewed anyone like that specifically. I don't recall. Um, did, uh, this is another question. Um, did Mr. Helmer use any of the resources of the Bronx County Historical Society in his research? Well, I know that he he did consult with people in the society. I don't know. Is Lloyd Alton connected to the, the Bronx Historical? I know he he interviewed him at length. He he was very Lloyd Alton was very helpful to Bill in his research and in his writing. Yeah, he's a he's a member of our board and uh, borough historian emeritus and uh, An institution himself. Yes, yeah. and he's acknowledged. He's acknowledged in the book, and he I, I know that he was very helpful. Um, Judith Carl wants to know: Did you get to go to Co-op City or City Island, and how did that walk go? Both places, we we definitely walk through. They were both very interesting. Co-op City is really a city in itself. It, it's a very well-kept area. The people are very happy that we spoke to who are living there. They have everything they need. They have to, they have a whole shopping mall within City Island. They they have they have a whole social network. There's community activities. They they're, they're large friendship groups. People are very just very happy living there. And uh, the people we spoke to, they they felt that they had a great deal. They had a, a, an apartment that was not expensive. In some places, it, they had there were these townhouses as well where they could have their own garden. They were they really enjoyed it, and it was it was nice walking through and talking to them. I and mean, it's not a 
a really bucolic place because it's got all these tall buildings, but it's got a lot of grass and trees and, and gardens. And it just, it was kind of a pleasant place. You could see that the, that it would be a nice place to live, you know, and people felt that way and they were very proud of it. And uh, City Island is, is, like I said, it's like a resort or fishing village at the same time. And if you want to find great uh, fish restaurants and things like that, and it's very beautiful. There are homes on the water that are really, really beautiful. And, and uh, it's an interesting place to visit. I don't really understand this question, but TJ Torres wants to know if there were stories that amazed you in the Yankee Stadium era. Maybe he's asking about the stories I about the Yankee Stadium baseball. I think it's a Yankee Stadium area, the neighborhood. Oh, area. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Thanks, what, is, what is the question? Uh, so did you have any, when you met people around Yankee Stadium, did you, were there any interesting stories or about their lives, about what, what life was like in the concourse in, by, by Yankee Stadium? I don't know about in terms of near Yankee Stadium, but people, a lot of people, lived on the concourse years ago and it was considered a great status thing to live on the concourse so that even if they didn't live on the concourse, they would say they did <laughs> if they lived near it or around the corner or something like that, because it was considered a you know, really classy address to, to live there. There is a story I can tell you about baseball though. Uh, there's a street called uh, Edward L. Grant Highway in the Bronx. And it's actually named for a baseball player. I don't think he himself is from the Bronx. Why they chose the Bronx to name this street after him, I'm not sure. But he was a baseball player who was also, he fought, I think, in World War I. He became, a, a, I think, a major in the Army. He was a war hero. And he was also, what was interesting about him is that he was educated at Harvard. He played for the Giants, I believe. And when he would catch a ball, when he would catch a fly, he would, instead of saying, I got it, he would always say, I have it. <laughs> because he was a Harvard man. You know? So that's what he was known for. And that's, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Edward L. Grant Highway, but it's, it's, yeah, Highbridge, yes. it's in the Bronx. Right. TJ Torres would like to know what were your thoughts on the Sound View or Castle Hill areas in the Bronx? Well, Castle Hill is interesting because I think that's where Jennifer Lopez grew up. And we, on, I think, on Black Rock Avenue. And I remember we went down there and saw her house. And I told Bill about a song she had written where she said um, something like something like something about the rocks that I've got. I'm still I'm still Jenny from the block. She's Jenny from the block. I used to have a little. Now I have a lot. I'm still Jenny from the block. And that was in Castle Hill. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to remember a specific let me just look at my notes because it's hard to remember. There's, the, the book is about 32 different neighborhoods, so it's hard to remember exactly. Um, as far as you mentioned, Sound View. Um, yeah, Sound View in Castle. Yeah, Hill, Sound View is interesting because these Sonia Sotomayor houses are in Sound View. Uh, Sonia Sotomayor, our uh, Supreme Court Justice, grew up in the Sound View houses, which are a uh, New York City housing authority complex in Soundview. Uh, later, as a, I think, young adult, not maybe a teenager, they moved to Co-op City, and she lived in Co-op City with her family. And these the houses that she lived in are now called the Sonia Sotomayor houses because they're very proud, I guess, that Sonia Sotomayor 
grew up there, and it shows that you can have humble beginnings and you can rise to be a Supreme Court justice. Eric Bierenbaum would like to know, did you get to tour the Keynes Bridge in Fordham areas, which is where he grew up in the 1970s, especially the Keynes Bridge Armory, which has remained empty for decades? Uh, we definitely did tour those areas and the Kingbridge Armory. I think now there was an article in the paper about it recently that they're trying to decide what to do with it, whether to divide it, you know, to make housing there and to have other commercial projects in the armory. It's a huge armory. And, you know, when we were there, it wasn't really being used for anything. People talked about converting it to a skating rink. There, there was all kinds of discussion, but nothing at that point was being done. But I think it's going to that's going to change now. Yes, big push now. Um, Tony Mondesari would like to know: Do you have any do you have any impressions of the Williamsbridge, Olinville area, especially um, the Gun Hill projects? I'm sorry, the Williamsbridge. Uh, Williamsbridge, Olinville area, which is in the uh, Northeast Bronx, and the, especially the Gun Hill projects. Did you have any impressions from? No, I, I, there? I really don't. I don't. Re I unfortunately do not. I don't. I'm looking to see what I wrote about Williamsbridge. Oh, there was. I remember there was a store in Williamsbridge that we came upon that's called Zambo Aroma. And it's a store that's, it's an aromatherapy store, which is kind of unusual to find in, in the middle of the Bronx, but it sells all kinds of fragrant oils and creams and lotions and, and uh, infusers and incense and all kinds of healthful, you know, if you believe in aromatherapy, uh, it sold all these kinds of pro products, and it was a very beautiful store. And the owners of the store were very interesting because he said he he and his partner had adopted six children that they were raising. And uh, it was a very interesting person, the owner of that store, which was in Williamsburg. Yeah. Howard, Howard Rose would like to know, did you walk to any of the sites, forts from the American Revolution when, uh, this isn't his question, but, you know, by... Sedgwick Avenue along the Jerome, Jerome Park Reservoir, uh, and closer to close, close to the heart of the approach to the, what was then the Kingsbridge. Well, we did walk every block pretty much, so I'm sure that we we did walk there, and we did walk forward, in which the other gentleman asked about as well. Does anyone else before we sign off? Are there any other questions? I'll 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 ask I'll interject one more more question in here that that's occurred to me. Um, uh, what were some of the most I guess you could say unusual um, things you encountered in the Bronx? I'll give you a couple of examples. I don't know if you saw these or not, but on Pelham Parkway, for instance, um, uh, towards the end of of Pelham Parkway, um, before you get to uh, Pelham Bay and all of that, there's a house on yeah uh pelham parkway that has all of these the life size that's yeah. that's the one that's the one yeah it's, it's fam famous pretty famous in the bronx um, yeah you know that's just one of the very unique kind of uh things you might find in the bronx if there's anything else like that that stands out to you um, yeah well the christmas house is certainly worth seeing it's quite amazing but i'm sure like you said many people know about it it's just dazzling it's unbelievable with all the mannequins and and all the lifelike things that you know moving around and it's just amazing but we did see other very unusual things for example um at lehman college underneath the college itself there's a series there's a network of tunnels and there are two actually two networks of tunnels one network of tunnels is below the main area and it's used by students and faculty and staff when the weather is either very bad, you know, too hot or too cold, and they go through those tunnels to get from one place to another. But underneath that set of tunnels, there's another set of tunnels that's very hard to access, but we were able to gain access to it. Somebody actually let us in. 
and it's a long, long labyrinthine, uh, uh, just row, uh, hallways of dimly lit hallways with pipes all along the sides. There's a lot of them hissing and doors along the sides leading to who knows what and all kinds of mechanical contraptions that we couldn't identify. And we walk through these tunnels, the two of us, here and there, there would be digital clocks flickering, telling us the time. There was no cell phone service down there. So I was sometimes wondering if we ever would find our way out. And if not, who would ever know that we were down there and who would find us? And we walked there. It was very long and very strange feeling walking through those tunnels. This was not for the claustrophobic. <laughs> and and finally, we, we got out of, we found a staircase leading out and we were able to get out, went out the door and the door locked behind us. And <laughs> we spoke to someone at Lehman College who told us that during World War II, the college was vacated by students and it was taken over by the the waves, you know, the women's um, volunteers for the Navy and also by the women who volunteered to, for the Coast Guard. And they were stationed in that in, in at Lehman College. And it's thought that those tunnels might have been used to store weaponry. And you know, secretly store weaponry that couldn't be seen from outside, that couldn't be seen from above, that was hidden from anyone's eyes, especially enemies, and that they they kept and that some of those contraptions and things may still be left over from that time. We don't know, but it was a very interesting walk <laughs> through those tunnels, and um, also at uh, Lehman College, there's this huge head of an Olmec warrior. Uh, it reminded me of Asamandius, you know, this, this great big, huge, fierce looking head on the ground. And it was presented to Lehman College by the, the Olmec, by the Mexican government to commemorate this pre-Mayan civilization, the Olmecs, because Lehman College had opened up a Mexican studies department. And so in recognition of that, the Mexican government presented them with this replica of an Olmec head. There's also the Peace Grove at Lehman College, where in, for about a few months in 1946, the, uh, the college had the UN stationed there. The United Nations was stationed at Lehman College. Another interesting thing, speaking of colleges, is Bronx Community College, which is an absolutely beautiful campus and has two amazing libraries, um, the Gould Library and the North Hall, both beautiful, very well-equipped libraries. But in addition, it has the, um, the Hall of Fame for Great Americans, which is a colonnade um, with busts of famous Americans who who had who, you know who made great contributions to American society, like Thomas Edison and Alexander Hamilton and Robert Fulton and Nathaniel Hawthorne and and many others. It, the last one, I think, the the latest one that was installed was FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So no one has been added in a while, but there's still space. So if they ever want to add anyone, they can. They can. Those were some very interesting things that that we saw. And just just to to riff off that for a second before you move on to the next question, Roger. There was an earlier question about what people who already know a lot about the Bronx could you know learn from this book. Um, much much of what you were saying there, especially I you know I I'd heard about some underground tunnels at Lehman, but I didn't know. There were multiple layers. I mean, you know, you can pick up things like that from the book. Um, all of these just wonderful little um, nooks and crannies of of the Bronx uh, that unless you live in that neighborhood or unless you frequent a place, you probably won't necessarily have um, very much experience of or, if, you know, unless you have friends who live in that neighborhood. So so that that's, I think, really good answer to that question. Those are fascinating stories that you just shared. Thank you. George Bulow would like to know, on a recent walk along University Avenue, we came across the home Fiala uh, LaGuardia lived in, near the original Croton Aqueduct, the Croton Aqueduct Trail. Did you and your husband find that, as well as the Linear Park along Aqueduct Avenue, 
And Aqueduct Avenue is also referred to as uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Jr. Uh, Boulevard, sometimes confusingly, but they're the same same street. Well, we did walk Aqueduct Avenue, which is a beautiful park-like street in University Heights, I believe, uh, with greenery, sometimes on one side, sometimes on the other, and sometimes on both sides. And there are playgrounds and benches and places where people can barbecue. And it's really pretty, especially in the spring when the trees are in bloom, when the flowers are starting to bud on the trees. And it's, it's very scenic, very pretty avenue to walk down. And Robert Farkas wants to know, you know the, the University Heights and was originally NYU and uh, right, the, the college Lehman, was, Lehman, Lehman was Hunter, Hunter College. Yes, and, the and the community college was originally NYU. That's right, yes. Gregory Jost wants to know if you have anything to say about step streets. I'm, I'm thinking it probably means stair streets, connecting, well, connecting, there, connecting roads. There is a, there are many many. I don't know which stairs he's referring to, but there are many many you know flights of stairs in the Bronx. It being a very hilly borough, but there was one flight of stairs that was quite amazing, and I. The name of the street is escaping me at the moment, but the the stairs were painted with colorful X's on each on the on the riser of each step were very brightly colored X's that had been painted. Uh, it's almost like a a mural, but painted on stairs instead of on a flat wall. And it, it's we talked about it, and it's in the book, and there's a picture of it. Although, I. I I'm not sure if actually if there's a picture of it because without color <laughs> it doesn't do it justice. But it, it's quite something to see when you you go down these steps. You have no idea. Then you turn around and you see all these X's in red and yellow and blue and green and purple. And it's quite amazing. Do you have the TJ Torres wants to know if you have any thoughts or stories? Like you already talked about Palm Parkway, but about the, the Marshall Parkway and Woodlawn Cemetery. Well, we did. I Woodlawn Cemetery has a lot of very interesting sculptures. That it, it's a very large cemetery. There are famous people buried there, but you need a, a map. You need a guide because the graves are spread out. There's not like one person near another person that you could recognize. So you really need a guide. You need a, some kind of a map of the cemetery. Uh, what was the other the other part of the question? I'm sorry. Um, if, you, if you had any stories from the, the Marshall Parkway or the Pelham Parkway area in the Bronx? Well, all I can say is that they're very th those areas of those parkways are very pretty because they have very large grassy malls in the center, almost like park like areas. Bellum Parkway actually does have park like areas in the center and on the sides where people can get together. Years ago, they used to have horseback riding. I don't know if I don't think they still do, but I remember in the past that people used to ride horses on Pelham Parkway. And Moshula Parkway also has that kind of greenery. Yes. Okay, do we have any other questions? I think there's a few more there maybe, Roger, can you see them? Oh, there are, I think maybe they're just statements. Oh, so Leslie Cutler wants to know that the Sotomayor houses, or she wants to tell us the Sotomayor houses were originally the Bronxdale housing projects, yeah. and she lived there in the 1950s, and Michelle, Rusko once went to Lehman College in the early 70s and she walked in tunnels to classes mm -hmm. and also saw offices with original phones and desks from the World War II period. And Howard Rose n notes that the, the parkways, the Moshlu, uh, Petona Parkway, Helen Park were connected to each other to connect the parks. And that Peter who asked some questions earlier, played in the NYU band in 1977 for the dedication of the John Philip Sousa bust in the Hall of Fame of Great Americans. So we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of native sons and daughters tonight, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I just want to apologize to those of you whose questions I wasn't able to address so well. Uh, I, we walked this neighborhood, it was about five years ago. And since then, so many things have happened, like COVID and my husband passing away at the very beginning. And so the my my recollections are not as sharp as they might have been uh, had I not gone through all these kinds of difficulties afterwards. But I I will always remember the the great times we had walking through the Bronx and how pleasantly surprised I was. I had never had much um, contact with the Bronx itself growing up. I grew up in Brooklyn, the kind of neighborhood I grew up in. If you went into the next neighborhood, it was like going into a foreign country. So go, going to another borough like the Bronx was like going into outer space practically. As When I was a kid, we didn't have a car and we hardly went anywhere outside of our own little narrow neighborhood. Um, but I really enjoyed walking the Bronx. I found it fascinating. And as I said, the people were friendly and it was really a joy to walk through it. Really, thank you very much for doing this. What a really wonderful interview. And William, Kinsella, William Kinsella wants to know, is that the Crone Aqueduct on the cover of the book? And yes, it is. It's the Aqueduct Walk. <laughs> yeah. very, very good photograph. It's also, yeah, right. I'm just looking at the picture. Yeah. And everyone, buy the book. It's very good. And and, and also, speaking of the Crow not It's think, on sale. That's right. That's right. And keep keep an eye out in the spring or summer. Roger sometimes will do a walking tour from Poe Cottage to uh, the High Bridge. Uh, yes. Um, it, it deals with the Crow and Aqueduct. It's a long, long walk. But, um, it is, but uh, it's very historic. <laughs> that's yeah, right. It's downhill, Crow too, for most of it. Croton was, I don't know, how many miles away? Like 41 miles or something. And the aqueduct, the, the water would come from the aqueduct by gravity. It, right. it, it was not pumped. It, it came through the force of gravity. That's how it ran through. And I'm, I'm just going to, for oh, yeah, right, right before we close, I'm just going to uh, send the links again to the book. Um, in case people didn't get it when maybe joined us a little a couple minutes late. And I'm also going to send a link to the Historical Society's website. So hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, okay, any any other questions, Roger? I think he wants to know if there are signed copies, but I don't know. I don't know if there are. No, the, the book came out posthumously. Okay, thank you so much, Helene. Really, really wonderful and a wonderful You're book. You're very welcome. Really thank great, you. Great guide to the Bronx. Thank you very much. Be well. And thank you for having me, and you stay well as, as well. Thank you. Thank good you. night. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you at, at future events, and uh, have a good night.